So uh, another thing, another, um, and in fact, when Woolsey was testifying, there was already concern about the prospect of international terrorism in the post-Cold War world. But the, um, uh, that concern became much greater after the ele uh, 11th of September, 2001. Um, but the thing to be emphasized about that is anyone who thinks that international terrorism began, say, in 1998 with the bombings of the uh, embassies in, in uh, Tanzania and uh, Kenya, or anyone who thinks it began in 2000 with the bombing of the USS Cole, uh, or anyone who thinks it began in September 2001, has a very rosy colored uh, memory of the Cold War, or, or a sense of what happened then. In fact, you find that international terrorist attacks were far more common during the Cold War on average year to year and in the number of people killed. Uh, during the Cold War than it has been after. Um, there were, uh, and again, um, being as someone who grew up in the late 1960s and 1970s uh, and into the 80s, the, um, I do remember the hijackings that occurred at that point. For a considerable while, these were taken as routine. And it was, it was thought that one of the risks of flying was the possibility of hijacking. These days, that, is, that threat, although occasionally, once in a great while it still emerges, is almost non-existent now. And that's as a result of the introduction of relatively simple security procedures, things that in the past didn't exist. For example, when you go to an airport now and get screened, for various objects. That's really the introduction of procedures in the late 60s and the early 70s to deal with the threat of hijacking. And in fact, you found that hijacking after the introduction of those went way down. But for a considerable while, there were hundreds of hijacked aircraft. Um, more importantly, though, was the rise of Middle Eastern terrorism in the uh, early and mid-1960s. This occurred before the 1967 Middle East War. Um, it, it became uh, on a larger scale after 1967. And in fact, the main uh, source, though by no means the only source of international terrorism, has been from the Middle East ever since. But in addition, um, and I'll get to some of the attacks in, the, in a second, but one point to emphasize, even though it wasn't the Soviet bloc that was sending terrorists, there, were, there was concern, and it has turned out to be justified concern in light of the declassified documents that have emerged, that the Soviet Union and its allies were, in fact, arming and training and funding terrorists. If you want to see, for those of you who know Bulgarian, if you log on to the commission that was set up to oversee the state security archive here in Bulgaria, you'll see a large volume of declassified documents that they have made available on the internet. It's available as a very large PDF file, and it takes a long time to download, let me warn you, but, um, but you can see it. That's one example. The, uh, uh, Bulgaria was by no means the only one, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, East Germany in particular, um, and the Soviet Union. The, uh, some of these attacks were ones that, again, even though there wasn't anything comparable in the number of people killed to September 2001, several of these did result in hundreds of casualties or at least highly visible terrorist attacks. This group in particular, Black September, became notorious for some of the um, highly visible and grisly attacks that it carried out. Black September, for example, was involved in the assassination of the Jordanian prime minister in 1971, which was followed soon thereafter by a massacre at Lord Airport in Israel. That attack was carried out by the Japanese Red Army, but it worked in collaboration with Black September. The uh, Israeli athletes who were murdered um, at the, in Munich at the Olympics in uh, 1970, September of 1972. That again was perpetrated by Black, uh, Black September. Black September got it, the name of its organization from 
uh, an operation carried out by the Jordanian government in September 1970 to move out Palestinian communities that had been harboring terrorists. As a result of that, the uh, Jordan became a frequent target of Black September's attacks as well as Israel. There was an attempt by Black September to smuggle bottles of perfume onto aircraft in 1972. It was broken up by the FBI. But it does make you wonder, I was here in 2006, which was, uh, what, 34 years later. Um, in August 2006, and that month there was an attempt by, uh, or at least a report of an attempt by Al Qaeda terrorists to bring explosives onto aircraft in Britain using bottles. Now, why in those 34 years someone hadn't designed some sort of technology to detect those kinds of explosives, I can't really tell you. But the um, Islamic Jihad which then emerged uh, largely as a result of the Iranian Revolution of 1979, which radicalized a lot of uh, Islamic extremists around the world. And as Iran then became a major um, source of, of uh, arms and, and funding for terrorist groups. Islamic Jihad carried out large-scale attacks, especially against US and Israeli targets. The US Marine Barracks, which was bombed in September of 19, uh, I'm sorry, October of 1983, killed 269 people. Uh, there were numerous other attacks carried out by Islamic Jihad that uh, killed hundreds of people. Um, perhaps most spectacularly, the Lockerbie bombing in 1989. Um, but the, uh, these, again, were attacks that people tend to look back on the Cold War and forget about them. But the major point to be emphasized here is that international terrorism is not just a post-Cold War phenomenon. To regard it as such, I think, just as a complete distortion of what went on during the Cold War. Um,